Welcome to the Rider Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. Really big teeth. And Larry Korea. I want to suck your blood. Today's episode, Monsters Round One. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Rider Dojo, everybody. Uh, Larry and I are back with you today, and we were kind of brainstorming what we wanted to talk about in this episode, and I was going to get all philosophical and, and, and ridiculous, and Larry's like, Steve, we haven't talked about monsters, and then I forgot entirely everything else I was going to say, because... I love talking about monsters, and I know you do too. Well, it's kind of ironic that we've gotten this many episodes, and we haven't talked about the thing that I actually like made my living on. Yeah, uh, you know, because like, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm the author of Monster Hunter International, that gigantic series, and um, it's all monsters. It's all monsters yeah. all the time, and and I we think about this because we were actually earlier tonight we met for dinner, and we were. Uh, brainstorming for the second book after Servant's War. And we, part of that, we were talking about some of the creatures we created in the background. Because that book's not really about the creatures so much, but they, they exist. And we were talking about some of the ones we created and where the ideas came from and how we we're going to use them in the future. And I decided, you know, tonight would be a good episode to talk about how we create monsters and what makes a good monster, a good creature, and kind of like what goes into that. Can give these guys some nuts and bolts for creating their own monstrous things. Now, for a little context, as Larry said, we, we, were, we were meeting today and we were talking about, uh, before we were recording, you know, these, these few episodes here, we were talking about the monsters and it became, I mean, th this happens to us all the time. We, we end up like kind of fixating on, on one thing that kind of geeks us out for a second. Uh, and so we were talking about all the monsters we created for Servants of War and how ridiculous they were, kind of where some of them came from. Um, the, and, and then kind of the layers that we added to a few of them to make them worse than they were on the surface. Oh yeah. So l I, I want to use servants just to start our conversation. So in servants of war, spoilers, there's some monsters in it. Especially in that last portion. Especially in the last portion, but also in the very first chapter. Oh yeah. Uh, we talk about these kind of cat-like demon sort of fey fairy creatures that come in and uh, spoiler from chapter one of the book they cause some damage to the main character's village uh, and, and I'm and I'm leaving putting that lightly leaving it purposely vague for yeah. the people who haven't read this. <clears throat> if you haven't read servants of war um, you need to hurry and do that because um, I like money and I'm unemployed currently. We are honest. This is a very and, honest podcast. And uh, I would like to remain unemployed for as long as possible. Yeah, um, Steve so would to like speak. to just use this to make the jump to, uh, to just full-time writer. And and as part of that jump, one of the things that, that I found myself doing, and, and, and again, Larry and I were talking about this today, uh, I've been one of the secret projects I mentioned. By the time this airs, you'll probably know what that secret project is, but... Um, I got asked to write this novella, very grim, very grim, dark novella. And I wrote some weird, crazy monsters in that. Um, I like creating monsters. I like that in Servants of War, we are able to take like a very fantasy world that has a lot of familiar aspects to it, you know, kind of a, a pseudo Russian, pseudo German conflict of, you know, of countries. Eastern European, yeah, very Eastern European yeah. based. And I like that we were able to add in monsters or allude to monsters that are very familiar and then create other ones that some of you might be wondering where my brain goes when I think about these things. Because we start, okay, so that's a good way to talk about it is like where you start point from. So we're writing this book that's kind of like Eastern European folklore. And so obviously that suggests a whole bunch of uh, creatures that are from Eastern European folklore. That's kind of a no brainer. But then uh, Steve took them to hell yeah, and had the Hellspawn abomination version. So at one point, um, this was Steve's idea. So at one point we had like these big monstrous bird things, right? They're being menaced by these big monstrous bird things. That's cool, right? Only Steve, you know, took that up a notch because this is taking place in literally hell. Yeah. And so this 
bird creature, giant vulture looking thing, but it's almost like very skeletal and rotting, undead looking bird thing lands. Kind of human hands instead of, instead yeah, instead of, of bird instead of, instead claws. Of, instead of, yeah, so it's got like almost like pterodactyl little things at the end here. And it lands, and that's pretty terrifying, right? But then its beak opens, and Steve describes the beak opening in three directions. Yeah. Like and that. then what's revealed is the bird was a living thing once, only the monster is not actually the bird. It's what's living in the bird. Yeah. Because all of a sudden these It's horrible, got a bird skin suit. It's wearing a bird skin suit because what they're barfing up tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> and then the characters, uh, this is another trip we'll get into, but the characters then describe it in their own words. And the picture that the, that's painted by these guys' words is like, it's a bag of worms paint such a good picture. And so Steve just kind of like created this horrible, awful thing. And then it gets worse because then the, the, as it starts barfing up the tentacle things, they have to deal with fat and it gets really, really gross. Mm. Um, but it was just, a, it was a unique and it was an original monster that he came up with and it worked fantastic. So we had like the basic starting blocks of where we're going from and we're building the monsters and we're kind of going from there. Uh, and then when in the same scene, we also introduced some other things that we just kind of kept in the background. We teased them. I mean, literally far off in the background. Yeah. So all we needed to do with this was to, to, to kind of paint a picture. We referred to some of these elder races, these fey creatures that had once lived in our world and had kind of been pushed to the boundaries. Well, they came to watch. Mm -hmm. So we never actually even get a good view of them, but we just kind of described them in this like very creepy way. Um, they had like kind of elongated bodies they are too tall. Their limbs are too long. They're too skinny. They're too spindly. And, and the characters just get these little glimpses of them, but it just paints this. Never, really. never full on. No, never full on. Now for the, for the weird bird skin suit sack of worm thing. Um, if that appeared in more scenes, we'd have to actually name it. Yeah. No, I don't like naming monsters. Um, because... To name them almost gives them, I don't know. It eliminates some of the unknown. It normalizes them. It's yeah. like they have a, it, 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 well, because you're a horror author. Is, yes. Is, you've talked about the show many times. You talk about the fear, uncertainty, and, and doubt or fear, uncertainty, shock. Fear, dread, shock. Fear, dread, shock. But How dread, un dread right? and uncertainty kind of go together. Yeah. So yeah. by, by naming it, you know, by, by, if it has got a, if it's got an entry in the monster manual with stats, you can kill it. Yeah. You know, whereas when I'm writing Monster Hunter, we have to kill it. That's the whole point. That's the job. That's the job. Yeah. So for me, when I'm writing monsters, I got like different layers of monsters. Monsters that I want to keep that horror element, I leave them more mysterious. Mm -hmm. Monsters that I want to make that's just business and it's our, our fun action scenes, they're the ones that get the stat block. Yeah, like we know what to kill. How oh, to kill these them. are zombies. That's a zombie bear. Yeah. Like for example, like one of the most terrifying creatures I ever created in the Monster Hunter series was the Humboldt Folk. And I've never truly explained who they are and what they are and how they work because they are scary and they're eerie. Once you know, I explain funny. them, it kind of messes, it ruins them. You know, it's kind of funny when you bring that up and, and maybe this is just a product of, of imagination. And I think this will prove the point. Um, you know what, it, you know what it puts me in the mind of, it puts me in the mind of that one episode of the X files where it's like the totally not Andy Griffith show, but the horror version. Oh, yeah. That black and white episode? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a good episode. Um, it's called- Postmodern uh, Prometheus. Is that what it is called? Isn't that, isn't that Postmodern Prometheus? I don't think so. I th I know. I don't think that's what or it's is called. Is that a different episode? Okay. Anyway. It's been like 30 years. I know. <laughs> but you know, like, it's like these like very rednecky sort of people. They have the, the, the mom like under the floorboards mm -hmm. and that episode is hyper violent. In fact, when that episode first aired, it had, um, it was one of the first like- mainline TV shows to have like an advisory before cool. it because that episode's effed up. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's one of my favorite episodes. Great episode. Um, that anyway, my, my point here is, is even though you haven't described it, um, you haven't described them in, in like concrete terms. Um, what that does is that allows, that allows the reader, um, to assign attributes to it. And, and to assign and to assign personal creep factor and and fear to it. But you know, you you assign those attributes, you assign those fears. Now now you were saying that since they're only described from other people's point of view, um, 
you get a lot of flexibility there, I think. It is. In fact, that was one of those creatures that, because it was so creepy, later on during the Monster Hunter memoirs, uh, John Ringo described them in more detail. And I actually edited that out. Oh, interesting. I didn't know this. Yeah, because what happened was I was like, and I, that's what I told John, is what I just said is like, okay, that's that's cool. However, you can't because that is one of the more terrifying, mysterious creatures in the Monster Hunter universe who I'll probably never like go head to head with because uh, they want they just want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. um, and by going head to head, by, by, by establishing rules for them, it removes the mystery. So like it was like later, this is like 12 books later, you know. And so here I am 12 books into this thing and, and I have in this book and it's describing how these creatures work. It kind of makes them less awesome. It makes them less terrifying because this is one of the only things that these guys are actually scared of. Whereas everything else, they just go head to head with like all sorts of stuff. Now, so part of the thing is when I'm creating monsters, I'm thinking, what's the mission of that monster? Mm -hmm. is, it, is, it, is it the horror element? Is it the dread? Is it the menace? Or is it something for a fight scene, action scene? Or is it a combination of the two? I was about to say, or both. Or sometimes in Monster Hunter, is it comedy? Is it straight up funny? Is it okay, yeah, sure. Like, you know, Mr. Trashbags, right? Oh, yeah. See, I've, I've taken, and with Mr. Trashbags, I take one of the most terrifying monsters of, and this is not creating a monster, but this is Using a, one. a yeah. spin on, a, on an existing monster. I take one of the more terrifying monsters from fiction, the Shoggoth from H.P. Lovecraft, you know, Mountains of Madness. Terrifying creature, supposed to be incomprehensible nightmare, and it is. Only I put a unique spin on it. So I take all the all the stuff that for the Shoggoth, only I have the one Shoggoth who is the oddball who falls in love with the human child and decides that this human child is like its best friend. Cuddle bunny. Cuddle bunny and wants to just like protect this human child beyond all comprehension. So it's extremely loyal and hilarious. And uh, and so I have this Mr. Trashbag's a recurring monster. People love Mr. Trashbags. I mean, we, we've done Mr. Trashbags children's stuff, you know. Uh, well, well, Jack has because I am artistically inept. But um, Mr. Trashbags is awesome. He's fantastic. I think I think for me, I, I agree with you. I think, I think whenever I'm creating a monster, it's what's the purpose? Um, I, I tend to, one, I, I, I almost always want to introduce the, the monsters in a way where it, they come into conflict with with the main characters in some aspect. Um, typically, a, you know, some sort of action scene or a chase or you know, fight or, or whatever, right? Uh, but I'm always looking at them and saying, in what way does the physical nature of this creature? How does it mess with the main characters? In their perceptions. Yeah, what is the interaction going to be? Mm -hmm. So, for example, a giant crow bird monster thing. Uh, fun story. The This originated from how uh, Catholicism uh, paints angels uh, in, like, the, in, like, apocryphal uh, texts. You talk about how like, they're described with, like, the flaming wheels with 18 eyes. And, yeah. Yeah. So, the crow thing, I, I started creating it that way. I was like, well, what if I took, um, you know, a raven, basically, because well, raven, ravens, ravens are, is a big, theme, is a big theme in the book. Um, but I wanted to, uh, in a sense, corrupt it even more than, than the fear it already caused whenever it showed up. So I made it bigger. I made it fatter. Uh, I gave it weird uh, human -y hands because, uh, in, in my opinion, the idea that... Uh, for monsters, I always refer to them as a dirty mirror of humanity. So when, it, when a human looks into a mirror and they see their humanity stripped away, their freedom stripped away, things of that nature, what's left is the monster, right? Um, and so that's where I started. I thought, I thought, okay, like angels, the way angels are described in, very, in some religions is creepy. Oh yeah, it's nuts. They're freaking, I, like they're, they're literally madness inducing uh and then you know i love me some hp lovecraft i love me some eldritchy uh monsters and so i was like okay how do i how do i increase this how do i give these soldiers who guns blazing halberds swinging uh you know they're, they've killed a lot of monsters so far they think they're doing okay and how do i make them feel like their way out of their depth 
And so it's it's all about layers. Um, kind of like the thing. Fantastic. So what what I want to do, Larry, is I, I want to go on a quick break. Um, we're going to come back. Uh, just so everyone knows, we're going we're gonna to keep this particular episode a little shorter because... Larry and I like talking about monsters way too much. So we're going to do a multi-part. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a part two to this. Um, we can do full disclosure. Oh yeah. Okay, guys, we're recording this in January, uh, in in uh, in the Salt Lake Valley area, uh, in an undisclosed location. I live on the other side of the mountains, and it just started to snow. Yeah, so we, we want to make sure Larry gets home safe. Well, we're at like two hundred percent snowpack now, and it's uh, nuts. Where I live, it it goes nuts. So we're gonna yeah. like wrap this up <laughs> yeah yeah so we're gonna so keep this episode die. short and then we'll just do a part two as, as our next episode following this one all right so we'll be right back what part of the second amendment don't you understand that's the question posed by award-winning new york times best-selling author and professional firearms instructor larry Curia. me bringing with him the practical experience that comes from having owned a high-end gun store and as a competitive shooter and self-defense trainer, Korea blasts apart the emotion-laden, logic-free rhetoric of the gun control fanatics who turn every mass shooting into a crazed call for violating your rights, abusing the Constitution, and doing absolutely nothing to really fight crime. In his essential new book, In Defense of the Second Amendment, Korea reveals why gun-free zones are more dangerous for law-abiding citizens, how the Second Amendment does indeed include your right to own an AR-15, and why that's not an outdated concept, why red flag laws don't work and can be easily abused and ignore a much more commonsensical approach to keeping guns out of the wrong hands. The insanity of criminal justice reform, the freeze dangerous criminals and gun reform that penalizes your right to self-defense. How can we return to a society that has a safe and healthy relationship with guns as we had for most of our history? Believe me, I've heard every argument relating to gun control possible. I can show you how to defend your rights. Urgent, informed, and vitally important information for whoever owns a gun, or is thinking about owning a gun, or who cares about the preservation of our constitutional rights, in defense of the Second Amendment is a landmark book of enduring importance. Coming January 24th from Regnery. All right, everybody, welcome back. I'm glad to have you back with us on this, uh, on this episode where we're talking about monsters. And when we left off before the break, we started talking about the thing. And I think the thing, as in the movie, the thing from outer space, so to speak, um, you know, it's it's come in multiple iterations. If you haven't seen it, you really need to because it still cold, holds up. Holds up from 1985 or mm -hmm. whatever. It's fantastic. Still holds up. Now, the interesting thing about that, there's an old there's an old saying when it comes to monsters in horror or or whatever in, in straight up monster movies, and that's that you never show the monster early. Um, the thing bucks that trend. Oh, yeah. And I, and I think, I think people, there's a lot of people, and I've talked with a lot of horror authors about this and, and they keep coming back to, oh no, you never show the monster early because then you let all the mystery out of the bag. I'm like, mm. I, I said, you know, I understand I, that. I disagree. I understand that, but there are many mechanisms in which you can show the monster early and still get that fear, still get that dread and still get that shock. And I think the thing perfectly illustrates it. Because it screws with your perceptions as the viewer, and it screws with the perceptions of the main characters. Well, and also it, it it's an it's one of we'll talk about subtypes in the next episode. But this is an evolving monster. Yeah. Uh, and so even though you see it at one point, that doesn't mean you've seen it because uh, the way the thing unfolds, every step of the way, there's like a different weird thing. The movie Aliens, original Aliens, is the same thing because you had the chest, you had the face hugger. Yeah, it was it was egg. Yeah, it's egg, a face hugger, face hugger, chest burster, and then the full on, full on monster. Yep, and uh, it's the same kind of thing. So in that, I mean, we're what fifteen minutes into the movie when he gets face hugged. Ten minutes into it's the movie, it's pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick. Um, and and so it's the same kind of thing. Thing with when the when the husky explodes. That's in like the first ten minutes of yeah. the show. Yeah, when the husky explodes, it's like what the crap. And so it's one of those. Well, but then you got like Jaws. You don't see the shark until the last. But you know what it is. Yeah, it's a shark. Yeah, which is the worst monster for Steve. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Steve. But um, so I, I, I don't buy into the like don't reveal the monster early thing because it, I think it just depends. Yeah. Monster Hunter International, I having I'm having a werewolf fight. Within the first like page. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we're like two pages in, you know, we're having a werewolf fight. And so it just kind of depends. Um you have some 
Like, if you're going for a horror, pure horror kind of thing, you can see where the monster is revealed later. Uh, horror movies will do the thing where they'll have, like, uh, they'll in the first couple minutes, they'll have the establishing characters who aren't, like, they don't matter. They're just there to die. Yeah. And they'll be on screen for, like, three minutes. So, like, they, every episode of Supernatural. Yeah, and then they die, but you don't uh -huh. really see what kills them. You just know mm -hmm. they die, and then it sets up, oh, element and of then, danger. And that sets up the mystery. That sets up the, the, yeah. the discovery aspect of it. Yeah. Exactly. So, that's one of those, there's not really a right or wrong way to do it. Uh, like I said, I, I've made my living off of getting right into the monster. So it just kind of depends. Now, like when I said the evolving monster subtype, that's a monster that like you've just because you've seen it doesn't mean you've seen it, seen it. Well, and I, and I think that that's, that was kind of the tactic that I wanted to take with the weird bird monster. Oh yeah. I wanted them to be like, okay, we know what that is. It's and a then bird. They, they kill it. Except it doesn't quite die. And then... It gets worse. Well, as barfing up a blob tentacle monster yeah. is all of a sudden able to re wrestle power armor. <laughs> I'm interested. I, I'm. I, I think there is a, a pretty heavy um, difference in your in approaches when you're talking about taking an uh, an established monster, like say a vampire, werewolf, or whatever, versus creating something that's a new, fresh horror. Yeah. And I've done both. As have I. Yeah. It's one of those, because like Monster Hunter, people ask me, well, I've had people ask me, so what monsters are in this? All of them. All of them. I mean, really, because like that's the whole point of the book is it's, it's a, it's a book about a company that hunts monsters. So I hit all the traditional ones, uh, but I always try to put my, my spin on them. I try to put like a spin for me of like how I want to write them, like werewolves, vampires, zombies. The big, those are the big three, you know, uh, yeah. you, you get into all the different types of like traditional monsters. Then I get into like monsters from folklore, uh, where I will take monsters from legends, myths, every different culture. Uh, I will go out and I will scour the internet looking for different monsters and I will take what information there is, what stories there is, who I can draw from it. And I'll put my, try to put a spin on it. Mytho ancient mythology is another great one to draw from, but these are all existing things. Then there's some you just make up whole, I just like out of nothing, or you have to work with a uh, folklore, a name, yeah. you know, like it's like for Monster Hunter Alpha, I had, it was a werewolf novel, but I also had a specific subtype of werewolf, which was an undead werewolf called, called the Vukod Lock. Yeah. And from that, it was just basically like the word for werewolf from like uh, Serbian, I think. But it was like a, it was like, and it was just listed as like vampiric werewolf. Yeah, is how it was referred to. Well, and and in, you know, you go back far enough in the origins of vampires and werewolves, oh. often commingle, right? Well, because a lot of this stuff wasn't codified. Right. It was a myth. Yeah. Like like, uh, Farmer Jones died horribly, and we don't know what killed him, so we're gonna blame it on the Volkod Lock. Well, what's you know, a Volkod Lock? Uh, it's a. It's a thing. It's a thing. Scary. It's scary, and no one wants to see it. I mean, realistic, Farmer Jones probably just, you know, fell on his own sickle. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or he got and, eaten and by... It, and it happened, and, you know, and his, 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 uh, you know, his pitchfork happened to stab him in the neck twice. Yeah, who knows? But the thing is, people come up, or, or a lot of these, like, ancient things, was just a dude who was a serial killer, murdered a bunch of people, and they're like, well, that's the beast of such and such. <laughs> or, uh, you know, we go back to Salem, 1692, and... Uh, and a whole mess of women were vilified and and lied about and turned into witches because some other women were jealous of how good looking they were. Yeah, I and mean, that was even before TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, and, and it's interesting, right? Because the, the further back you go, when you start talking about monsters and folklore and things of that nature, it's the distinction and the line between superstition and supernatural. Yeah. Where they couldn't distinguish the line. Yeah, well, there's there's the thing. If people are going to come up with stories to explain the stuff that happens, that's just how it is. Yeah. Something happens, people come up with a story. We do it today. Even though our explanations today don't tend to be as supernatural, we will still come up with, uh, you know, the weather's weird. Well, clearly that's global warming. Yeah. And not just that the, it's snowing. You know what I mean? Yeah. People always have to have to come up with a thing for that. And so historically, monsters have been a thing to explain. Well, like a lot of monsters, if you read mythology and folklore, it's like, well, there was a famine. There was a plague. Well, we can't just say that, like, you know, we had a famine or we had a drought. No, that's clearly the fault of the such and such that lives in the forest who is angry. Or, uh, you know, someone in authority in that exact same uh, situation says, you know what? 
if we sacrifice a bunch of people to appease this uh, dark god uh, or this monster that's totally out in the woods eating people, uh, yeah, it'll make things better. You should listen to me. And they create that hysteria. Yeah. Well, we still create hysteria. It just tends not to be monsters. It tends to be something different. Well, it's still a monster to it's some degree. It's still a monster, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the idea, and, and, and I think that's another idea. And that's that's why my monsters are cooler. We can actually kill those. Yeah. You know? Well, and it's a different, it's a different mindset, right? Um, y you know, something like Monster Hunter versus HP uh, Lovecraft, right? Yeah. You know, you, your guys are like, you know, cowboy up, kill the monsters, get paid. Yep. Right? That's the company In motto. In Lovecraft, it's, well, maybe we won't die and hopefully we don't go too mad. Tell stories. It's well-spoken New Englanders telling each other scary stories in the dark until someone goes insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually, it's funny because there's a lot of Lovecraftian elements in Monster Hunter, but Monster Hunter is way more Robert E. Howard influenced than it is H.P. Loving. Right. And, and, and I think that. It's punch the monster in the face, not be as great. Other. Then there's other, you know, it's like uh, sexy time with the monster is an entirely different uh, genre of book. Yeah. And, and I do think that we've lost, I do think we've lost monsters to a degree. Well, some. Or we had for a while anyway. I think we're seeing a resurgence these days. Well, one of the things that did really good for Monster Hunter, one of the things that launched my career was timing. So I wrote Monster Hunter and I had vampires as a bad guy and I had bad vampires. I went yeah. old school powerful, scary as crap, dangerous, not messing around. There, there was nothing good, redeeming, sexy. If, and I refer to one point as like, as if a vampire is sexy, it's like a one of those lantern fish that hangs out the yeah, light yeah. to get things to eat. And that's uh -huh. how, you know, it's like, hey, I'll look, I'm sexy. And then they eat you. It's more 30 days of night vamps. Yeah, I went scary vampires. But timing wise, Monster Hunter came out after the peak of Twilight. Twilight had had the sexy, sparkly vampires. So actually, my book came out at the perfect time for the anti-Twilight backlash. You, you got the pendulum. Right. So when people were like, man, they ruined vampires. They ruined vampires. They made vampires dumb and sexy. And this is stupid. This is not Dracula. This is not what I grew up with. I want vicious. I want Christopher Lee, right? Yeah. So well, let's be fair. Christopher Lee was pretty sexy. But. <laughs> Indeed. Well, those Hammer movies had a lot of hot chicks. There was a lot of hot chick vampires in those, let's be fair. Okay, so um, Monster Hunter comes out, and it's like, I went old school with my vampires. They are bloodthirsty killing machines with basically superpowers. And I had a bunch of badasses fighting them to the death. And audiences read that, and the timing was perfect. So actually, I owe a lot to Stephanie Meyer at the beginning of my career. Oh, we all, I think we all do. You know, I think we all, we all end up to some degree... Um, you know, benefiting from from the paths that other people well, were treading in front it of wasn't, us. It wasn't that she did anything for me. Is that, that her, she had she treaded a path, and you were like, "Not that path, guys." And, and I didn't this do it on one. purpose. See, it's look just, to me, a vampire <laughs> should be a terrifying, vicious thing, and I'm writing an action novel. Yeah. And so for me, the timing was perfect. You know, and that's one of the things I owe my career to. Now, guys, we're going to have to cut this episode a little short because I don't want to die. Uh, I have to drive through a very yeah. icy canyon. I live away up in the mountains, and so we're going to do a part two this episode because we got a lot of stuff about creating monsters nuts and bolts and i promise next episode we'll be back to our normal time yeah we will we're, we're sorry about that but you know it's more important that larry be able to show up to the next recording session. <laughs> uh and if you don't understand like steve's been up my driveway it's a really long driveway yeah and it's very steep okay three inches of snow doesn't sound like much until you have to push it for a quarter mile yeah screw that dude yeah and then it's like ten thousand inches <laughs> all right everybody uh Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you have specific questions about monsters or the creation of monsters, um, hurry and get them in. And, and maybe we can take a couple of them either in, in the follow-up to this That's or, a idea. or uh, even even a third part because we adore talking about monsters. Yeah, like we went up, our action part was a three-parter. three, three -parter. Yeah, so, you know, it was part three of two. <laughs> so, uh, look... Uh, get your questions in when it comes to creation of monsters or uses of monsters and et cetera, et cetera. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Um, but again, we answer the, we, uh, we answer the questions of the supporters first. So thank you so much. Uh, this is the Rider Dojo and we'll see you on the next one. Larry drive safe. Rider Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song 
Word Mercenaries by Craig Nivo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. To me, a vampire should be a terrifying, vicious thing. Yeah, that was even before TikTok.